Um, Abdul Aziz is in New Orleans and I'm joining you from San Diego. Um, these are both unceded lands of native peoples, which include the Kumeyaay people of the San Diego and Tijuana region and the Chittimacha, Huma, and Choctaw people whose ancestral home includes present day New Orleans. Each of these groups still inhabit these lands today. And I wanna acknowledge our gratitude for the opportunity to share this space with them. I mentioned Aziz is a photojournalist based in New Orleans. And I wanna share a little story. It's kind of our own origin story, his and mine, um, which is a shared story of the photojournalist James Noctway. Um, for me personally, I met Noctway shortly after 9-11. And I remember hearing him or listening to him talk very informally about what he did as the building started coming down. He was in New York City. Um, and I was really, really amazed at this man's fortitude, um, not, not only to pursue the career that he's pursued, um, but to do it with such grace and dignity. Um, and then they made a film about James Noctway called War Photographer. And if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to watch it. It's amazing. It's, I believe was made in 2003, um, but at the time it was really groundbreaking because they attached a tiny camera to his camera so that people could witness what he was seeing as he was taking photographs. Um, this is long before cell phone cameras and social media and other things. So it was really a very innovative thing. And when I met Aziz, um, he told me that this film also had a profound effect on him. And, and his story really began there because that's what drew him into photography was the work of another photographer and the work of a film, um, which is a really powerful story that I'm not gonna steal from him. I'm gonna let him share it with you uh, himself. But if you would go ahead and turn off your video, I'll be turning mine off as well. And I'll turn the stage over to Abdul Aziz. Thank you so much for that, Scott. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Abdul Aziz. I am a freelance photojournalist based in New Orleans, as Scott mentioned. Um, and I have focused primarily over the course of the past decade on conflict and war, both uh, overseas, abroad, and here domestically in the United States. Um, I was most recently named uh, Documentary Photographer of the Year by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, uh, which was a tremendous honor. And I am currently a fellow uh, at Tulane University's, uh, a Monroe Fellow at Tulane University's uh, New Orleans Center for the Gulf South. Now, the accolades are fantastic and great, but I only bring them up to say that uh, they don't matter. <laughs> they don't really mean anything to me. They are wonderful. I'm grateful for them. Uh, but the reason that I do this work is not for accolades. It's to tell stories, to tell narratives that may potentially change the world, uh, or at least change the mind of one individual who can then take that out and uh, uh, take take what they've learned and 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 do something to to change the condition for other people. Um, this isn't, photo, photography is not my first forte into storytelling. Uh, at the age of 19, I purchased uh, what was back then a digital video camera, a digital high eight camera uh, from Sony and me and my friends, we started making little films around uh, school campus. I went to Loyola University in New Orleans for political science. Um, and at that time, uh, I found that I really had a knack for storytelling via filmmaking. Um, fast forward from making little films with my friends to uh, the a year later, I found myself at uh, in Nepal shooting a documentary for Discovery Networks on uh, Buddhism and Sherpa culture in uh, the Mount Everest region. So I had an opportunity to be uh, uh, and extensively document um, Buddhism and Sherpa culture in the Mount Everest region. I, I did Everest. It was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. Um, from there, I went on to document social issues in Somalia, uh, in Morocco, Ireland, all over the world where people's stories uh, might not be uh, seen or heard in uh, the larger media outlets. So that's really where my passion for storytelling comes from. Um, around 2008, 
uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my personal journey in terms of becoming a photographer. I decided in 2007 that I wanted to be a stills photographer um, and focus more on that crap. So at that time I bought a little camera called the Nikon D40, um, which was the entry level DSLR for Nikon at the time, but uh, was really exciting for me because it taught me kind of the mechanics of the camera um, and how to take photos um, use, utilizing the SLR platform. Um, so at that time I was working, one of the reasons I bought that camera, I was working for an organization called the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana. The Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana is an organization that focuses on juvenile justice advocacy work, ensuring that uh, conditions of, of confinement for juveniles uh, isn't oppressive or uh, dangerous. At the time in the state of Louisiana, there were a lot of problems. Kids were being beaten in youth prisons. Uh, so I really wanted to figure out a way to use my camera to tell the stories of what, were, what was happening on the inside. As director of communications, we then would be able to use that uh, to lobby, uh, you know, politicians around uh, fixing these issues that existed. And fortunately, we were able to shut down three youth prisons in the state of Louisiana uh, and force the state into a federal consent decree that ensured that more uh, access to uh, livable conditions, especially in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, uh, were provided for juveniles because, as we knew, juvenile justice, the juvenile justice system was built as a rehabilitative system. So I say all that to say the job that I adored and loved so much, 2008 happened. Uh, and we all are familiar with the economic downturn that came uh, along with 2008. And uh, unfortunately, as a result of that, I was laid off from my job uh, at the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana, which was pretty devastating for me at the time. But something really special happened. And to speak to kind of what Scott mentioned here, uh, about two or three weeks prior to being laid off, I came across a film one night uh, called War Photographer about um, the prolific war photographer, uh, James Noctway, Jim Noctway. And uh, I watched the film. It was really, really, really compelling to me. Um, I immediately became enamored with his work. I had obviously seen his work previously, but I didn't really know the story behind the person and the story behind the intention of what it is exactly that James so beautifully focuses his, his lens on so, so often. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen here, which I probably should have done already. Uh, I'm also a tad bit nervous, uh, so bear with me, uh, but I hope that you'll join me on this journey through my work, through my process. And most importantly, as I talk today, I want you to think about uh, two primary themes, which are intention and purpose. What is the intention uh, that we bring to our photography as photographers? Uh, and what is the purpose? What do we hope to get out of it? What do we hope to gain? Personally, what do we hope to uh, bring or, or manifest into the world with the artwork that we create? So bear with me just one moment and I'll get started here. And Scott, if you can just tell me if you can see my screen. Yep, we are good. Perfect. So I entitled this lecture, Tumultuous Times, A Decade of Conflict and Uncertainty. And we have seen no shortage of either of those two things, particularly uh, what we've been facing over the course of the past year, which is one of the reasons that we're even here today on a Zoom instead of being together in person. Um, these are tumultuous times. Um, and this is my forte into telling stories in these tumultuous times. So as I said, war photographer, Jim Notway, just prolific, an individual that has such a fearless heart, but such a high level of humility in terms of what he brings to the craft for all of us as photographers, uh, as journalists, as storytellers, as individuals who are interested in putting their bodies and their lives on the line to tell these stories. Uh, I remember the first time that I saw this documentary, it, it just blew my mind. It blew my mind that someone could be so selfless that they would put their life on the line, that they would, they would risk bodily harm, that they would immerse themselves in the midst of, of chaos just to be able to tell the story of individuals who otherwise uh, wouldn't have that story told. So, as I said, I was laid off in 2008. Um, 
two weeks prior to that, I saw this documentary. Uh, when I got laid off, I was fortunate enough to receive a very generous uh, uh, severance pay. And um, around the same time, kind of serendipitously, every uh, things kind of all happen at the same time and happen for a reason. Uh, someone reached out to me and they said, you know, we're, we're about to take a delegation to, to Gaza. And this is in December of 2008. Um, some of you may know, at that time, there was a conflict that had just begun called Operation Cast Lead, which was the war between uh, the Gaza Strip, the Hamas-led Gaza Strip, and uh, Israel. Um, it became kind of a, a, a center point, a flashpoint in the media. Uh, and for me, a lot of the stories that were coming out were leaving out voices, critical vo voices critical to the conversation. So uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to take my my risk here uh, and I'm gonna use my severance pay and I'm gonna go to my first war zone. Now this is literally weeks after seeing this film. That's how inspired and moved I was by the power of photography, the power of storytelling, the power of journalism and a single image to change the dialogue or the, or the narrative around a conversation. Um, I uh, had never been to Palestine. This was my, to be my first time going to Palestine, to Gaza. Um, and I was a nervous wreck. So uh, a little bit before then, I had engaged in uh, some dialogue with some journalists on uh, an old platform called Light Stalkers. I don't know how many of you may remember that, but Light Stalkers was essentially a blog for people who were working overseas, uh, telling stories of conflict and war, uh, where they would share information on fixers, uh, individuals who would bring us uh, to the, the front lines, uh, et cetera. Um, so I had done a little bit of research. I knew absolutely nothing about anything. I was as green as green could possibly be when it came to photographing or filming war. And, uh, but I decided to just jump right in because this was the passion that I felt. Um, and, I, and, and oftentimes as photographers, we may struggle to find our way. When I first bought that D40, I was, you know, documenting stuff for the Juvenile Justice Project, but I also thought that I might want to be a fashion photographer. I thought I might want to do, you know, nature photography. So I'd, I dabbled in all of those different things, but nothing really struck me like what I saw James doing. And I set off to do or at least attempt to do the same thing by telling these stories of voices that are often unheard. So here we are in the Gaza Strip. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about each image. I don't wanna burden you with, with boring stories behind each one because there are a lot. It seems like I have 57 slides here, so don't wanna take up too much of your time. But I do wanna delve into uh, a few of the photographs and tell the story behind them because they are critically important. So when I went to Gaza, uh, I went through the Egyptian border, through the, Rafa, through the border town known as Rafa, um, which is in the Sinai Peninsula. Um, and uh, there's a, a Rafa in Egypt and a Rafa in, in, uh, in, in the Gaza Strip. And these cities were separated uh, when the lines were drawn uh, uh, to create the borders. Um, so a lot of people there have family, a lot of, a lot of deep connections on both sides of the border. Um, but that border had been sealed for quite some time. Now, I had to figure out a creative way to get in. So I joined a delegation uh, with a group called Code Pink, which is quite controversial at times, um, but they've done some incredible work over the years, uh, even uh, uh, though I, we may not have seen eye to eye uh, most of the time during that trip. Um, nonetheless, uh, they were the ones who initially set up the delegation. Uh, when we got to the border, we all jumped off of the, the bus thinking that the border would be closed because it had been sealed for quite some time. Um, but to our surprise, the border was open for the first time in what may have been up to a year or so. Uh, so we were able to get in and access was relatively easy. Um, upon getting there, uh, I, I one of the things that I like to do in my process is get to know people before I start photographing them. It's really important to me. I don't, I, I understand that you may not have this opportunity all the time as a photographer, uh, especially if you're covering fast moving uh, events 
uh, and journalism, such as war or even sports or whatever it may be. Things are moving so fast around you, you may not have the opportunity. But for me, it was important that I didn't just show up as the guy with the camera, the parachute journalist looking for a sensationalist story. Uh, I really wanted to connect with the individuals and the people. So I spent the first week, week and a half, really just on the ground talking to people before I ever, ever pulled a camera out. And this is one of those people that you see in the photograph. Um, so I was at a, uh, a dinner uh, that was being hosted by Hamas who rules the entire Gaza, Gaza Strip. Um, they had set up a number of people for us to meet with. Um, and this particular function was focused on the women of Hamas um, who share a significant leadership role throughout the Gaza Strip. And uh, the plan was for me to go to the home of a, a doctor afterwards and photograph um, just his everyday life uh, and tell a little bit of the narrative and story around that. Uh, as the event wrapped up, uh, the doctor came over to me and I, I saw a group of men talking to him prior to the end of it. Uh, and he came over to me and he said, uh, unfortunately, I can't invite you to my home for dinner tonight because they have other plans for you. So when they said they have other plans for me, I was like, I don't know what that exactly means. Uh, it was a little terrifying. Um, but nonetheless, I said, okay, I took the jump to do this. I want to tell the story. Uh, I've been very transparent and honest. I'm going to step out on faith here and just go and do this. I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to tell the story. And I'm glad that I did. Uh, so I was put into a vehicle, a little white Mercedes that I'll never forget, uh, that had completely blacked out windows. And when I mean blacked out, I don't mean tent. It was like a black cellophane that covered the windows with little holes cut out where uh, individuals could see through the front windows and the side windows. But for the most part, uh, it was a, a car that you knew was either high value or, or carrying some type of high level of confidentiality. Now the Gaza Strip is not very large at all. Uh, it's, it's only 20 something miles in, in length, uh, but they rode me around in this car for about uh, two and a half hours to make sure that I had no idea where I was, despite the fact that I had no idea where I was. Um, this is something that, and, and I knew at that point that there was something highly confidential that they were, were taking me to. Uh, I'll never forget as uh, lights started to dissipate and disappear off of the streets due to power outages or uh, specific areas, I realized that we were approaching the front of the war uh, operation cast lead. Uh, and at a certain point, all the people started disappearing off of the roads and um, the headlights were shining ahead. And I remember looking out of that little cutout and seeing a line of gentlemen um, with uh, RPGs and AK-47s and other military gear lined up waiting for me to arrive. Now, this was a great shock. They had told them that they had spoken to me over the course of the week, and it was a number of different factions. And this is something that you don't really always see. Um, the fighter that you see pictured here is a member of the Izzedin al Qassam Brigades, uh, which is the armed faction of Hamas. Um, he was a part of that initial line uh, of, of individuals. And uh, that line com was composed of, of factions like Islamic Jihad, um, Izzini al Qassam Brigades, uh, uh, the armed wing of Fatah also, all working together on this united front uh, to go to the, 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 the front of the, uh, the battle, um, which is something that you don't often hear. Usually you're hearing more about infighting between these groups than kind of their collective participation. So this gentleman afterwards decided to take me to his home. He was very excited to show me the RPG at which point he offered, they even offered to allow me to shoot the RPG. Uh, and I informed him that that would be a war crime if I participated in such. It was a tempting idea, uh, but I did not shoot the RPG that day. Um, nonetheless, um, it was a fascinating opportunity to be able to go into the homes and really get to understand who these individuals were. So this gentleman here is actually a lawyer. Um, he had completed law school, had his Juris Doctorate, um, but absolutely no access to jobs or any hope for, for uh, being a part of that. So uh, as a de facto uh, measure, he joined as al Qassam Brigades because that's kind of the only hope uh, in their mind, in their eyes, 
uh, of, of attaining uh, freedom is to become a part of this kind of Mujahideen movement. Now, this photo was taken, um, and I look at my phot photographic progression over the course of the years. It's, it's cringeworthy for me to show this photo because I, I, I don't consider it to be technically a great photo, but the story behind it and the personal narrative behind the story is really what, for me, is the most important aspect of it. Um, I went into this home, and this is actually him standing up against the white wall. Uh, and I pushed my ISO exposure as high as I could. Um, and then in post, uh, I love that it gives this idea that it looks like a studio photo almost, um, that it was shot in the studio. But in the bottom right hand corner there, you can see elements of the, of the wall. Uh, and what I did was push the exposure to, to create that effect. Um, this is a wall uh, uh, that speaks in itself. And when I try to tell uh, stories, it, 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 I try to create uh, a moment that brings you to the severity or the intensity of, of what I'm experiencing. On this wall, you see uh, the names of two individuals, Abu Wadia, Abu Rami, um, and those are bloodstains from an execution um, uh, right outside of a, a hospital in the Gaza Strip, known as Al-Wafa Hospital. <clears throat> Again, this is inside of that same home, uh, another one of the fighters. And I didn't include this photo, but at one point I was taking photos of the gentleman in the back and he had the AK-47 kind of pointed towards me and, and you see this finger come in like this and they, they put the AK-47 on safety, um, which was pretty shocking for me at the moment, uh, in that moment. Um, just speaks to kind of what you're putting yourself into when you, you go into these types of situations. Um, now, one of the things that I don't really like focusing on is sensational kind of blood and guts type photographs. Um, and this was an opportunity where I had uh, an opportunity to tell that, that, that type of story, but I chose not to. This young man is showing me, this was after what was, uh, 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 so what happens oftentimes in the Gaza Strip is uh, if a family is associated with or someone in the neighborhood is associated with an act of terror, um, uh, what would be considered an act of terror by Israel. Um, they uh, will do a, uh, what's called roof knocking, which is a small munition shot on the top of uh, an apartment complex to give people a few minutes to get out. Oftentimes this only is about two to five minutes. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this story is, this young man's family is actually uh, a little bit off of screen. This is after a bombing there. Um, and he's showing me the remains of his, uh, his younger brother and sister. Uh, and he's just stoic, uh, a very, very, very stoic situation. But for me, telling the story about him and his feelings was more important than going for the sensationalist narrative of blood and guts uh, that we often see in war and conflict photography. This photo was taken at a rehabilitation center. Um, this is a mother and son, her son, uh, had been hit with shrapnel and had stitches all the way up his uh, abdomen and stomach. Uh, and her leg had been completely destroyed and was in an absolutely horrific uh, state. Um, and this was a, a place, I, I, I enjoy this photo because of the intensity of the eye contact. Uh, again, I try to allow the stories or the photos to tell stories themselves because for me, again, this is strictly about the subject matter, right? This is strictly from an objective standpoint, me honestly and authentically telling stories in ways that allow for people to one, maintain their dignity, uh, but also um, tell their story themselves through the, through the images and, and, and who they are. Now, it was really shocking for me. Um, Gaza was a very intense situation. Um, it was as a still photographer my first time in a war zone, but I think that uh, I always knew that I was going to be able to leave. I always knew that at the end of the day, no matter what war zone I've had an opportunity to be in, I know that there's a plane ticket home. Uh, if I survive this, there is uh, a certain le level of dissociation that occurs. Um, now the moments and the feelings and the, the pain and the smells and the PTSD that all stays with me. Uh, and, and those are things that I never forget anytime I leave any of these international conflict zones, but I am able to come back to the United States in my home, to my home, right? And, and not have to experience these things. So I was a little rattled um, when I saw the current political environment in the United States uh, over the past decade. 
And I really started focusing my lens on covering conflict here, which ended up being somewhat as difficult at times as it was for me to do abroad. So in 2010, some of you may remember there was a huge controversy in the city of New York over the construction of what was to be an Islamic center called the Ground Zero Mosque. Uh, and that's what it uh, became referred to over and over again. Um, having come back off of the heels of the Gaza trip, I decided to head to New York. Uh, this was the ninth anniversary of 9-11. Uh, and there was a massive rally held uh, by an organization called Stop the Islamization of America that brought in uh, some international uh, big names that were Islamophobic and anti-Islam, uh, such as Geert Filders and Pamela Geller. And this was all staged in uh, uh, right, right by the World Trade, World Trade Center, uh, you know, still being constructed, reconstructed. Uh, but nonetheless, there were a lot of high emotions, a lot of high feelings about this, uh, what was to be an Islamic center being built in uh, the footsteps of, or, or the, the uh, you know, uh, right in the same place where Ground Zero was, which was considered hallowed ground, hallowed ground by so many people. Um, on this day, a lot of people ask me, what is it like to go out and photograph conflict or places that, that you know, individuals are, are losing their minds or, or expressing things in, in ways that you may not agree with? Um, and I tell them that it's oftentimes difficult. Um, I am a, a black Muslim man, um, which is very apparent. Um, and that's what happened in this brief video that I wanna show you. Um, and I'll be showing you a few more videos also of what it's like to be uh, in the midst of some of these hotbed situations. But this is me getting escorted away from documenting uh, the rally that day because one person asked me, uh, if I was Muslim, and then once that response was yes, I was attacked by the crowd. So here is a little bit of video of me being ushered away by NYPD, which became a very big deal uh, in that moment. <laughs> Now, you may have heard someone say, probably one of my favorite lines ever, if he's coming in here to instigate problems, then let him go. The only instigation that I had that day was being black and Muslim. Um, and that unfortunately triggered a number of the people in the crowd. And that is kind of what you have to deal with sometimes when you put yourself on the line um, and push forward into these situations. Now, this was the first time that I really experienced stateside, as an adult, I should say, um, a heightened level of anti-immigrant, anti-other uh, uh, sentiment. And I was very, very, very concerned uh, about that. And, and I decided that this was going to be what I really wanted to focus on over the next few years. Um, and then, of course, in the wake of the shooting of Mike Brown, I found myself in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, on assignment for uh, Al Jazeera with a wonderful jur journalist named Jordan Flaherty, uh, who gave me the opportunity to uh, be a part of this. Now, Ferguson was a watershed moment uh, in the sense that a lot of the activity that we've seen over the course of the past year now um, was, you know, Ferguson was a precursor. It was the first time that we saw, in modern times, my generation in particular, um, such a high level of resistance um, and community action uh, towards uh, what was happening on the ground in Ferguson, Missouri. So I remember showing up in Ferguson uh, at the height of the protests. Um, and these images are a little bit of that. But in the background, I really appreciate this image because you have this woman holding the American flag with hands up, don't shoot. And, and in front of her, you have this line of police officers who are just scowling and laughing and, and, and making light of, of the pain of this individual. But yet, 
she's managed to hold on to her, uh, uh, her sense of pride of, of, of being an American, even in a nation that historically has not, uh, uh, you know, favored uh, individuals like her and where she's having to wear a shirt uh, that says, hands up, don't shoot. So for me, this was a really powerful moment in my life. One of the things that was also very interesting to me was coming back here uh, to America and seeing the same types of, of barricades or uh, checkpoints being set up. Ferguson was an absolute war zone uh, with high levels of militarized police, uh, with checkpoints that restricted movement uh, as, as protesters were not allowed to stop on the street while they were walking. Uh, journalists were often grabbed and assaulted by uh, police uh, on that on those days during this, this these protests, um, and it just it speaks to why it's important to tell these stories. Otherwise, we allow power structures to go unchecked, uh, and 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 stories that we we can identify with that could potentially change the narrative or change the reality for so many of us uh, will go unheard. This is at the Canfield Green Apartments, uh, where Mike Green was shot, just short, like, just off screen there is where the, the major memorial was. But I came across these two brothers who um, uh, were there protesting from out of town. I do believe they were from North Carolina. And uh, I just found it striking that they were both carrying these portraits of Martin and Malcolm and uh, uh, were there kind of continuing this tradition of resistance, of demanding uh, a better existence for, for not only black people, but all marginalized uh, communities uh, that are deeply impacted either by police violence or just by hate and bigot bigotry. And, uh, you know, hopefully these are things that we can, can move past. So fast forward to New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, many of you may remember in the wake of uh, the shootings by Dylan Roof in South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina, where uh, a number of African-Americans lost their lives uh, to violence. There was a big push to remove Confederate monuments and Confederate flags nationwide. Um, we saw South Carolina take down their Confederate flag we, uh, from their state capital. We saw a number of, of, of these movements, but really at the epicenter of it was New Orleans. Uh, in this photograph is of a gentleman named Ken Parker. Ken Parker is a neo-Nazi uh, who, and also the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan in Jacksonville, Florida at the time when this photo was taken. Uh, Ken came to New Orleans after a, uh, a, a message was put out that all patriots and uh, you know red-blooded white Americans should come and defend uh, the removal of these Confederate monuments. This photo is taken at a place in New Orleans called Lee Circle, uh, which had for many years uh, had a monument to Confederate General, General Robert E. Lee. Um, and it was, you know, it's a major part of the city. It's, it's, it's a, a place that everyone sees when they come to town. Um, and for a number of folks, people were fed up with it. They didn't want to see it anymore. So at the time, Mitchell, Mitchell Landrieu, who was the mayor of New Orleans, had issued a number of uh, uh, mandates that uh, these Confederate monu monuments be taken down. And that's why Ken Parker was here that day. Uh, I met Ken Parker. He was unabashed in his racism, um, happy to call me the N-word a number of times and see Kyle in my face. Um, and here, here he is hoisting the Confederate flag with pride. Now, an interesting fact about Kim Parker, Kim Parker uh, following Charlottesville, who was all, he was also there in Charlottesville, uh, had an opportunity to see himself in the media and see some of the reports, including this photograph uh, uh, that I published with Splinter Media at the time. Um, and he had somewhat of a change of heart. Uh, Kim started attending a black church in Florida uh, that opened him with welcome arms and uh, has since renounced his former neo-Nazi ways uh, and has uh, taken up law school and focused on becoming a civil rights attorney. So it's interesting sometimes how the power of a photograph or an image uh, is able to sway or help you see yourself as well. Um, and this was, like I said, the Battle of New Orleans, they deemed it. Uh, 
this is also another one from my Confederate monument removal. Uh, this is a young man who was 13 years old, donning his Confederate flag hat, standing in front of the monument to Jefferson Davis. Now, one of the things that really fascinated me, right, is, you know, I, as I started covering these, these Confederate monument removals, there were folks who were not the folks I traditionally thought would be the ones standing in defense of these Confederate monuments. This young man here, his name is Kanjanksha uh, Kumar Kata, and he is the leader of the Proud Boys uh, in the state of Louisiana. Here he came out to defend the same monument I just showed you uh, to Jefferson Davis uh, with his AK-47 and, and uh, Glock sidearm, um, dressed and ready for war. Uh, now, a little bit of the backstory, a few days prior to this, uh, he and a few of his fellow patriots had um, shown up uh, and uh, were immediately met with members of, of uh, you know, who were not willing to allow people to stand up with Confederate flags uh, in their city um, and, and what has become affectionately known as Antifa, I suppose. Um, they uh, had a little bit of a scuffle, so he felt that he needed to be prepared for this. I spent a lot of time with him, and one of the things that I wanted to really have a deep understanding is, is uh, how the son of, uh, he was actually, uh, KK is what he goes by, um, was uh, born in New Jersey uh, and is of Indian descent, East Indian descent and um, really just took a, a liking to the Confederacy for some reason. Um, but when you have these conversations with individuals like this, you really dig in and you try to understand where they're coming from, uh, even if it's completely a foreign concept to you or something that is not you know, uh, in line with your, your personal thought process. Um, and the idea is to remain completely objective. It's hard to remain objective when people are throwing racial slurs at you. Uh, but I found him to be a really interesting character. As did I, Arlene Barnum. Arlene Barnum is also a, a staunch advocate and supporter of the Confederacy. And again, seeing a black face just made me really inquisitive. And sometimes I really wanted to find, I, I, I find it in, so important to dig into the stories and really deeply understand these individuals without any type of bias on my surface. Um, and, and I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to do that. So flash forward, now this is all in 2017. These, this is all in 2017 and, and the political environment and the climate of the country is just intensifying, right? Like we're, we're starting to see these larger presences of right-wing groups uh, show up at, at events with guns. So this was at an event called This is Texas in Houston, Texas, where a fake Antifa page on Facebook prompted an absolute frenzy by saying that they were going to tear down the statue of Sam Houston. Um, and there was another call put out to Patriots nationwide to show up and come and take a stand against Antifa and make sure that, that they defend their heritage and uh, uh, that, that this won't happen. So what happened at this event though, is that some of the world's most violent white supremacists showed up in addition to Confederate flaggers, uh, in addition to Texas Patriots, which were three totally separate groups of individuals that all absolutely despised and hated one another. Um, but I felt it important to take the time to once again, dig in and try to understand where are these people coming from? Like, what is it that has driven you to act in the way that you are, to say the types of things, the divisive, racist, horrible, anti-Semitic, uh, horrible, disgusting things that you say? Um, and I feel like as journalists, as photographers, oftentimes we're the only ones that can tell these stories, right? Like, we're the, we're the people who are tasked with uh, ensuring that people hear things honest, honestly and truthfully and in an unedited, unfiltered way. And that has been historically the goal of, of my work is to make sure that individuals, whether I like them or not, still have an opportunity to tell their story um, and, and share their views. So we can either gauge how dangerous they are or have a deeper understanding of what maybe some of the trauma is that, that led them to be the individuals that they are. 
this member, this is a member of Vanguard America. Vanguard America is, uh, was the precursor to uh, a number of larger groups that became uh, pivotal uh, and major points in history, such as what we saw in, in, uh, on January 6th here in this nation when right-wing organizations and Trump supporters uh, uh, stormed the Capitol. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But right alongside uh, this white supremacist, once again, this is Arlene Barnum, one of the staunchest support supporters of the Confederacy. Uh, and you know, it's it's always interesting being able to see who is it that is uh, together, right? Who are the people that are showing up to this together? And do they hate each other? Are they in support of each other? Uh, but I wanted to share this because it, it just it's an astonishing moment for me to see this black woman uh, who told me that she used to be a Black Panther actually. Um, in the midst of all of this, taking taking on this this particular aspect of 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 uh, her work in her life. So now Charlottesville. This is something that I think we all are very very familiar with. Um, having documented over the course, you know, the Confederate monument removals, uh, as well as what was going on in Houston and, and places like Portland, et cetera. Um, I caught wind uh, because I had made the time to make connections with white supremacists. Um, and su to my surprise, they called me. They sent me the flyer for this Unite the Right event that was going to be taking place on August 11th through the 13th in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, and when I got that call, I realized that I had to be there. I had to tell this story. I had to. Uh, document and put myself in the middle of an experience that probably wasn't the smartest idea uh, for me to be jumping into. But once again, because I love my community, because I feel so passionate about the work and because I believe in the process of storytelling in an authentic and real way, I felt like I don't wanna see this on the news myself. I have to be at the center of this in terms of, of understanding what's going on. I have to document this moment. And that's exactly what I went to do. Now, I'm gonna show a video uh, for the next five minutes and it's kind of a long video and I know we're getting close on time here, um, but I just wanna just do this really quickly, really briefly, because I want you to understand what it feels like to be in these situations. So here we go. This is the torch rally uh, that has become so infamous.
Now, I know that that was long, but I really wanted to take you into what it's like to be in these situations, what it's like to put your body on the line, put your life on the line, especially in instances where you can die, where you really can be, when you can die. And you know that your identity, who you are as an individual, uh, is that puts you at a greater risk. Um, it's not easy to do this work. And even watching this video, as many times as I've seen it now, uh, makes me a little bit of emotional and brings up like a little bit of PTSD because to remain objective while telling stories already is, 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 is a task that I think is hard for a lot of individuals, right? Because we're all passionate as individuals about what it is that we feel, what it is that we see, what it is that we experience. But to experience this in, in real time and then maintain a level of objectivity is kind of our, our our goal and our, you know, it's our mandate as journalists to be able to tell these stories in a clear and effective way that doesn't bring our personal emotion into it, but the situation itself can evoke uh, emotion and ideas within oneself to either change, accept, adapt to uh, what they're experiencing. Um, and yeah, that's that's intense. This gentleman is Asmodor, and I'm. I know we're wrapping up here shortly, but. We're gonna keep it moving. Um, Charlottesville was intense. It was a very, very intense situation. Uh, this is a member of the KKK getting their eyes washed out. Um, and I, I, I like to call this photo, the baptism of hate. And again, once again, uh, never forget Heather Heyer who lost her life uh, that day when James Field smashed uh, into the back of this car, uh, pinning her uh, and murdering her that day. Again, these are the stories that must be told so that we can move beyond this reality that is, is marred by racism, by hate and by bigotry. And that's why I continue to stay engaged in this work and tell these stories. This is a moment where uh, an individual who I saw uh, in New Orleans for the Battle of New Orleans uh, also called me a nigger to my face uh during that time and it's a rare moment where i stepped outside of myself as a journalist uh to address it wow uh so the movement for Black Lives, fast forward, last year, George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd created a movement unlike anything I'd ever seen um, with my own eyes in the United States. Uh, I'd been a member of the protest community for a number of years, but to see the number of people that came out was fascinating. This photo is of a young woman named Dawn who is just a powerhouse, a leader in her community. She's only 20 years old in this photo. And uh, it's, it's been one of the photos that has resonated with so many people. 
uh, because of the intensity of the moment where she's staring down this police officer on the night of June 3rd on the Crescent City Connection, which is a bridge here in New Orleans that links the East Bank to the West Bank. We were all tear gassed uh, and shot with rubber bullets that day on a bridge uh, that is hundreds of feet, feet in the air uh, with no guardrails. Many people could have lost their lives and I'm grateful that no one did. This photograph was taken as I snuck behind uh, the police line uh, and positioned myself in between two police cars. Immediately after that, the police saw me, kicked me in my back, back out into the tear gas. Um, and this video is a little bit of that. So you'll see me at the very beginning of the front here. Uh, uh, I'm the photographer taking pictures. And at this point, evidently I've covered too much conflict because I'm unfazed, it appears. Oops. Considerably in the past couple of, oh, past couple of seconds. And now we have just seen something, uh, oh, that was getting close to me. Uh, so that's the photograph that I was taking there. Uh, the police were, Incredibly violent that day. Um, as you can see, they have their weapon trained on me, uh, which could have killed me if he had decided to fire it and which he had every intent on, as he told me, and I quote, and forgive the profanity, I will fucking shoot you. Um, so I wanted to make sure uh, to take a uh, photograph of that. Uh, and I did not relent. I continued to cover uh, because this was a critically important moment in time. Fast forward, uh, another unarmed shooting in Lafayette and a Louisiana senator uh, saying that he uh, would drop 10 of them, meaning protesters if they came to his city. The NFAC or the Not Fucking Around Coalition uh, decided to descend on Lafayette, Louisiana, which is an all black militia uh, to show their force and that they were not gonna take it. Now as a counter, of course, the white supremacist Cajun militia showed up uh, and it became an incredibly dicey situation. Now, tumultuous times are not just war. Uh, COVID has impacted us deeply as well. Um, over the past few weeks, I've been documenting COVID and the impact on the rural South, specifically on black elders. Uh, this is for a story that I did for the New York Times with a reporter named Andrew Jacobs, um, which I was really grateful to have this opportunity. Um, and out of all of the things that I've documented, nothing has hit me this hard. Uh, I've never cried as much as I did during the story. Uh, or during editing these photos because the individuals in these stories, though I didn't know them at the time, hearing their stories uh, were so incredibly deep. Uh, I encourage you, I, don't, I will post a link in the chat uh, to the story. I don't wanna take up too much more time because I wanna get to your questions. Um, but just some of these beautiful elders and their struggle uh, and, and what it has taken. These are the stories that I wanna continue to tell as a journalist. I wanna tell stories that impact lives and change people's hearts and minds or encourage them to do things that may be beneficial to them. This photo is of uh, Dorothy Wells uh, in her home. And this one really shook me up um, with her caretaker uh, in the background. Dorothy Wells is 84 years old and has owned her home in East Baton Rouge Parish for 50 years now, um, but she lives by herself uh, and, and has struggled to get access to COVID and fortunately for her was able to get uh, her vaccine on the day that I met her. This photo is beautiful to me because it speaks to the resilience and beauty of, of my people, of people in general. Um, as I was leaving, and, it, and this, is, this is why I do this work. I do this work because I love people. I genuinely love people. And I challenge all of us who pick up cameras to, to train them on things that, that, that inspire us, that empower us, that empower our communities, that, that affect change in genuine and authentic ways. This photo was of her saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, as I was leaving her home. Um, and it, it just gets to me because this is a woman who's alone a good portion of her time and who may have been forgotten, but we were able to tell the story of her and, and hopefully bring some, some peace and happiness and, and being able to center her, nothing gave me a greater feeling than that uh, on that day. And finally, I'm sharing a little bit of work with you that I've not shared with anyone, um, really. I have a little bit of a snippet of it on, on my Instagram. Um, but I, I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to be the only person invited to the home of the George Floyd family, uh, to his brother in particular, Thelonious Floyd in Houston, Texas. And I just did this two or three days ago. 
Um, so I just want to share a quick snippet, and then we can get to questions. Yeah. Oops. And just really quickly about this audio, I usually record audio when I'm interviewing people, as all good journalists should, just for the record. But I decided to share a little bit of this snippet because I wanted people to hear him in his own voice. Yeah. His daughter is so young. She really don't know what's going on. And it's just, I think about it. She probably don't know that she has been given a death sentence, like I know, because I'm older. We know, the older people we know, not just my family, the moms around the world felt that when they heard him say, mama. He was calling out, but he knew that he was passing away. He knew that he was dying. A man called out for his mama. He said, tell my kids I love them. Nothing else to talk about. Look at the video. Conviction. Justice. It was amazing to have the opportunity to see inside of this home that has just become a make, you know, a de facto memorial for his brother. Here he has a picture of him in all the stages uh, since he's uh, had to deal with the death of his brother, George Floyd, um, and how he's been met with so much grace and love uh, and respect from politicians. Here he's pointing out a photo of Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, which he's incredibly proud to have had the opportunity to work with on uh, the recent bill that was just passed uh, less than a week ago called the George Floyd Bill. This is the flag that flew over the Capitol. Uh, and he was given this by Nancy, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. This is uh, a gentleman who works with a law firm for the George Floyd family by the name of Silky Slim, who is an advocate in the community and has been at pretty much every major shooting um, uh, in, in, in modern times, uh, but has helped organize these families and get them involved socially and politically. And then, of course, the funeral. And then people have been sending them these random gifts, these incredible gifts, like this full hand carved wooden cross. Um, and that's, that's it. I, I know I'm a little bit over time, so I'm rushing a little bit. I didn't even think that I could speak this long. But uh, nonetheless, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, you can see more of my work um, on my Instagram. I always post my stuff there at photo Aziz 504. Um, but I want you to walk away with one thing just before I get into questions. I really want you to walk away with what is the purpose and the intent? A photographer asked me that in the very early phases of my, my desire to be a photographer. And they said, what is, what is the purpose behind your work? What are you doing? And that's what drove me to do this work. I love my community. I love humanity. I believe that all of us should have the opportunity to tell our stories for good or for bad and allow individuals to create the narrative that they create around that. But I think that with intention, with and purpose, with, with purpose, uh, as we're telling these stories as journalists, as people who are dealing with hard subject matters, it's important for us to be objective and for us to allow our viewers to make their own choice and I think that when you do that, that the truth always comes out. And I always wanna be a steward of the truth. I always wanna be a steward of, of the individuals that I photograph because I love them genuinely as human beings from the depths of my soul and the depths of my heart. And I hope that my work honors them. I hope that my work allows for them to see themselves in authentic ways uh, for good or for bad. And to affect change in, in, in ways that is long lasting and creates a better environment for all of us. So again, thank you guys so much for having me. This has been um, nerve wracking, but I appreciate you just sitting with me for a little bit while I talk about my process and my journey. So thank you. Aziz, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's emotional just looking at this work and listening to you. And I, I'm sure I speak for everybody in just expressing gratitude for the work that you've done and that you continue to do. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. You know, when I um, 
introduced you, I mentioned the anecdote about James Noctway and my experience with him and your experience with his film. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about, which I think is a nice segue to the Q&A, is that um, this is the beauty of being alive is that we watch, um, we watch generations of people um, pick up, you know, carry the, the, the flame of important issues as it were. And, um, you know, I met James Nockway 20 years ago and, or just about 20 years ago. And it's really incredible that we're now, I mean, he's still working um, and we now have new generations of, of journalists like yourself who are continuing that. Um, so, yeah, um, I think uh, I also wanna remind people to um, please join us to turn on your video if you would like, I uh, certainly don't need to. Um, it's great to see faces and to welcome people and to allow you, if you prefer, to ask questions directly. Um, if not, I'm happy to read them. I will read any questions from the chat because we've had a few, quite a few. Um, and uh, I encourage you to use the raise hand feature. Um, I'll call out um, some individuals um, whose video is on. I'll assume that means you're able to ask the question yourself. But the raise hand feature is down at the bottom of your screen toward the right under reactions. That's an easy way to do that. So Amanda Dahlgren, do you wanna go ahead and ask one of the questions you posted? Yeah, I actually, I asked two questions in the chat. I think I'm just gonna go to the second one because um, I think it's more important. Abdul, what you do is so important for our democracy, for our, um, you know, for our country, for, for the world. And it kills me um, what has happened to photojournalism and journalism in general in the last decades. Um, you know, this idea of the citizen journalist who, you know, that, that somehow some brando capturing cell phone coverage, that that is somehow equivalent to what um, people like you do. Um, and that that has really affected the ability of a, um, somebody who's trained as a professional and has the ethical code that you do, you know, that that's affected your ability to make a living is really beyond frustrating. Um, so I guess, I don't know if you want to talk about that or if maybe that can just be a comment, but um, it just strikes me so strongly in, in, you know, hearing you and seeing the images that you've made. So thank you. Um, it doesn't even begin to, <laughs> to cover it. Thank you so much for saying that. It's, you know, photojournalism is a very lonely place too. I think that oftentimes we don't find a lot of support um, unless we directly um, seek it out. <laughs> a lot of times we sit with a lot of the trauma I know that I have for the past decade. Um, in terms of citizen journalism, um, I'm not necessarily completely opposed to it. Like I think that there is power in story, power in storytelling, um, no matter what the medium is, I think that it can be, be powerful. I have struggled for the past decade of 12 years of trying to tell these stories and have not gotten any, any breakthrough in that um, until the movement for Black Lives of 2020, um, when finally, um, you know, editors started reaching out to me and and saying that they were interested in and in helping me tell these stories or centering the work that it is that I'm doing. Excuse me, I get always I always get emotional when I talk about my work. Um, um, and it's been a really difficult journey for me because I do care about these stories and I care about the people that are in them. I am a citizen journalist. I'm not professionally trained in any way as a photographer. Um, and I understand that like, I'm so sorry. For me, this work is personal. It's about my community. It's about the people that I love. It's about the people that I don't love. It's about telling these stories. And I think that anyone that is courageous enough to do that, no matter what the medium, no matter what the format is, is a journalist. And is, it's critically important that all of us use our voice to change the condition in this world. I've seen a lot of pain. I've seen a lot of pain here. And I didn't even include a lot of the war zone stuff that I have here today because it's too painful for me to look at. Um, but I encourage all of us to use that voice. It doesn't matter if you're 
a fine arts educated degree holding individual, if you have the opportunity to tell the story of someone's condition, it is incumbent upon you to do that. It's incumbent upon you. And that's my mission. And no matter what the risk, no matter what the pain, the trauma, somebody has to do this work. Somebody has to do this work. And until my last breath, I'm here to do that. So it doesn't matter if you have an iPhone, use your iPhone. It doesn't matter if you have a Nikon D5. I don't even know what the latest camera is. Use it, use it for good, use it for good. Use it to change lives. Use it to be honest in your reporting. And as long as that authenticity and that honesty exists, then the story is going to be told. I don't care that I haven't been published a thousand times. I don't care about the accolades. Every time I post my work on Instagram, that's my ability to reach the community. That's my ability to tell the stories that are not being told by mainstream media, right? And fortunately for me, I'm starting to get to tell my stories in mainstream media as well, which is, is wonderful and beautiful. And I'm grateful to everyone for those opportunities. But the most important thing you can do is tell these stories. Never stop being honest and truthful in your pursuit of justice, in your pursuit of peace, in your pursuit of, of, of happiness. And that's the strength of, of storytelling and power of storytelling that I saw when I watched that film, War Photographer, and that I hope that following in the footsteps of these great journalists, I'm having the opportunity to do the same thing and change people's minds or encourage people to pick up that camera and go and directly confront the things that are important to them. Aziz, we have a question um, from April. I'll go ahead and let her ask that. Hi, hello, Scott and Aziz. Um, I too, sitting in my community college's photography club was inspired by the movie War Photographer. And um, I was lucky enough to be part of um, a journalism program, as Amanda said, um, that led with ethical code and that put that at the forefront. Um, when you were I was watching you as you were playing for us. Um, I like phone footage of being in the middle of conflict and it was difficult for me to not be incensed, but were you, as you watched it back, were you going through those moments? Like, how do you compose yourself and keep going when, as you said, people were calling you slurs and seek hiling at you? So for me, it's when I go into these situations, I'm a spiritual person, right? And like oftentimes, like I, I say my little dua, my little prayer, and then I don't remember what's going on after that moment, right? Like I really seek the guidance of my ancestors. I seek the guidance of, of, of my creator. I seek the peace and wherewithal to understand the importance of the mission that I've been tasked with, right? Even if I'm not on assignment, to me, I'm there to tell a story and that's the most important aspect of it. So I leave myself behind. And I think that that's what we have to do as journalists is just kind of like leave yourself behind in those moments, right? Where the end goal is tell this story authentically, honestly, and without fear, without the sense of of sorrow or embarrassment or fear or sadness that that you could obviously experience going into any situation like that, right? So for me, it's about fortitude, spiritual fortitude, mental fortitude, and honesty and authenticity. Uh, when I do that, I walk into these situations and I speak to people in a way that honors their humanity, even if they don't honor me. And that's not easy. It's not easy to be called a nigger to your face repeatedly. It's not easy as a, also my mother is Jewish. I grew up in a completely Hasidic Jewish community in New York. Like it's not easy for me to, to, to see anyone seek hiling. It's not easy for me to, 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 to see these vestiges that my family escaped, you know, to, you know it, it's, it's not because it's a complete and utter attack on every aspect of my identity, um, you know? And I, I think of that when I go into it and I understand the gravity of the situation that I choose to put myself in because I chose to put myself in the middle of that. No one said, go out and get called all these horrible names, right? But when I do choose that, 
I understand how important it is for me to keep my composure, for me to be able to tell the story in an honest, authentic way. Because there's nothing that about seeing a Nazi seek Heil in the face of someone or hearing someone directly call someone a nigger to their face that you don't, you can't make up your mind about what's going on. People will understand the truth and understand what's happening in those moments, right? I don't have to sway public opinion to, to they're speaking for themselves. So for me, again, it's allowing people to be their authentic selves. And to my surprise, people allow me into these circles because they're curious. They're like, why would you even want to come here? Like, why do you want to be a part of this, right? At that point, there was a certain point in that video where you might've heard the guy lean over to me and say, you're the nicest black Jew I've ever met, right? And I'm like, I know there's not a huge sample size of us, right? Like, of course, you know, but, but that's the leader of one of the most staunch, ardent white supremacist organizations in the country who leaned over to me. But because I approached him and despite my feelings towards him, despite my family history, despite all of the ways that I feel when I hear the things that they say, I chose to try to see the humanity in this individual. I chose to try to understand what trauma brought you to this place. What are the decisions? What are the external factors that made you believe that I am less than you in this moment? How did you arrive at this place? And because of that, I was able to develop a relationship with him, not one that I wanna continue or be his best friend, but I was able to develop a relationship that allowed for him to recognize me from other places. And that then allowed me to be intimately close to all of these individuals while they were spouting things that were so hateful and attacking my identity in ways that were, were upfront and present. So again, it's removing myself. And if we're going to tell authentic stories, at the end of the day, we have to do that. We have to do that. We have to remove ourself from the equation, our emotions, our feelings, while maintaining your, your, your situational awareness and being smart. But nonetheless, remove yourself. Remove yourself. Don't try to see it from their perspective, but try to understand what caused them to be in this moment in time. Thank you. Thank you for reinforcing my conviction. Of course. And mad love to you and all of your endeavors as you continue to traverse this world and tell stories. Aziz, uh, before we get to a question by Pierre, there was a, a question about security and what precautions you take. This was asked during, uh, as you were speaking. So I wanted to address that because it seems like an appropriate time. Sure. So uh, as it relates to war zones, I've never ever once worn black armor or uh, protected myself beyond just having general situational awareness overseas. Only after I started documenting pretty extensively white the rise of white supremacy, uh, this past summer, I, I changed that because of the heightened number of death threats that I received because of this work. Um, I uh, was sued by a principal here for defamation, defamation uh, to the tune of $10 million for telling a story uh, about him being at a protest, uh, wearing uh, a Tokenkopf ring and an Iron Cross, German Iron Cross, which are known Nazi symbols. He was dressed up in the whole thing and he said that he was, you know, there for uh, as a student of history. And he was the principal of the alternative school, which is a completely black school. Uh, it's the last chance school before you're expelled from the school system. And uh, I absolutely was not having it. So I put the story out there. Uh, he sued me for $10 million in federal court, but also mentioned repeatedly uh, and made me the target of a number of uh, high profile uh, white supremacist organizations um, who have come to my house, who have sent death threats, um, who have stolen things from, from my porch, who have left uh, menacing, uh, horrible things in my, 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 my life. My inbox is constantly filled with, with hate, conspiracy theories, the, everything that you could imagine. So as I continue to do this work and I've become slightly more high profile to these folks, I've decided to wear a bulletproof vest for the first time um, only because uh, it's, it's become a lot more um, 
uh, difficult to deal with, uh, and I don't want to die <laughs> prior to, you know, I mean, like contrary to, to, to popular belief, um, this isn't about thrills. Uh, it's about telling the story and I can't tell the story if I'm not alive. So uh, the people around me have convinced me that it may be a good idea to wear body armor. I always go into situations with a gas mask um, so I can continue telling stories. Um, uh, and um, just in case we're gassed, uh, and it's, it's helped. So that's really, this is the first year ever in my 13 years of doing this now that I've decided to wear some type of protective armor. Um, uh, and it's only because I'm, I am, I do literally have a target on my back at all times at this point, so. Thank you. Um, why don't we turn to Pierre for the next question. Hey, Abdul, thanks so much for this. This is incredible. And Davis and Medium for putting this on. Um, very powerful. Um, I had a bunch of questions written down, but you've already answered them um, <laughs> in this conversation. But I, I read an article, an interview that you did uh, a couple weeks ago, or I read the interview a couple weeks ago, and you spoke about how you were finding it difficult as a black photojournalist to get your work out there like you wanted to. I mean, you're getting success now, but it's taken a long time. Do you think you've kind of breached the the, the the obstacle of that, or is it still something that is very uphill? I think it's- Do you have any, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Yeah, I, I think that it's, you know, it's interesting. Like I'm interested to see how how much more editors will be willing to hire black voices to tell our own stories uh, in uh, the wake of everything that happened. I think the movement for black lives highlighted a lot of um, social inequities within the industry as well. Um, and I think there was a, major push in a rush to get black voices and black, you know, like black photographers into the fold um, of, of these major and, 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 you know, black indigenous people of color. Um, and this is just marginalized people in general, right? Like, yeah. I believe that we should be telling our stories. Like, like queer people should be telling queer people's stories, right? Like black people should be telling black people's stories. Like black, brown and indigenous people should be telling their stories and to have been historically left out of that process, not because of a, not because of a, a lack of talent, but because of the bureaucracy that exists within this industry in general, and because there's such slim pickings these days for journalists because of the advent of people with cell phones and all that other stuff. Like we understand, I understand that it's hard out here for all of us as photographers, right? But like it's 10 times as hard for, for marginalized, groups of people to break through in this in this industry and i've seen the willingness over the course of the past year to make that happen with wonderful folks like uh jane yamans who over at uh bloomberg and and i have some you know krista chapman from the new york times and and matt mccann and these people who have been trying to keep me engaged in the work uh also People from fine arts institutions like the New Orleans Museum of Art, like Russell Lord and 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 uh, Brian, who is you know my biggest champion. You know they're interested in making sure that this work is centered. So for me, a lot of times the archive of stories that I'm sitting on right now, they're still equally as important to me. But when I've historically pitched them, I've heard nothing back, like absolutely nothing back from anybody for 10 years straight, but it didn't deter me from telling these stories, from continuing to go out and do the work because it doesn't matter at the end of the day, right? Like if I need one person and they get to see that one photo and that one photo changes the narrative for them and helps them like come to a better place about the way they choose to interact with a group of people, then my job is done. And that's to me the most important part. Again, it's not about the publications. It's not about the notoriety. It's not about fame. Um, I yeah. want the stories to be told and like, I, of course, like if people are giving me opportunities to tell the story, the more the better, right? Like I wanna do that. And I'm also like completely open to understanding how to become a better photographer so that the, the, the photos themselves like are telling the story effectively. Like I have no hangups about that. So anybody in here, like if you guys wanna shoot, shoot me some ideas about the work that you've seen today or how I can continue to tell these narratives and stories and have them placed in places that allow for for people's humanity to be seen, please feel free to reach out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You're amazing, Aziz. Um, <laughs> I, I can't wait to be in the same room with you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So there's a, a question here from Rula Sikali, which reads, could you share your thoughts on what Susan Sontag calls, quote, image fatigue, 
And if images genuinely have to affect change, do you think your encounter with the now reformed white nationalist could be the norm? Hmm. Image fatigue. So that is also something that comes into play. I think that, you know, in society, we are one, especially when it's hard subject matter, specifically around conflict and war or any of these types of things, like it's hard to consume that on a regular basis, right? Like even myself, I have to take breaks. I gotta take breaks from the regular news. I have to like find ways to replenish myself and, and, and feed my spirit. Um, I do believe that images, even in a state of image, in, in a world of image fatigue, like I do believe that they still have the power, but it's it's about how you create that image and the intention behind the image, right? I, I feel like oftentimes people, res the work resonates with individuals because they, because of that passion that I have inside of me, right? Like I try to show that same level of passion um, through the images that I'm creating so that people can connect with them. Like, I want you to be there in that moment with me. The reason I showed you guys the video today is because I want you to be in the moment with me. I want you to see what it really feels like, what it, what it, what it sounds like, what, what, what I might be experiencing. Um, do I think that the encounter with the now reformed white nationalists could be the norm? I do. I think that oftentimes, like if we look at what happened on January 6th, all of those guys are freaking out. Now, some of that might be like from a selfish perspective, right? Like, uh, you know, they don't want to go to jail and the FBI is hot on their trail. So like, of course, they're going to be making public apologies. But I do think that genuinely some of these people see themselves and they're like, holy shit, what, have I, what am I doing? Like, I look like an idiot. Like, like I understood, like I got into this for one reason. Now I'm realizing that I'm so far along. This is the path that it's taking, taken me. And I feel like I can't get out of it. And some of those people do take the steps to get out of it. And I, I don't ever want to say that it's inauthentic, um, but I do believe that ha talking to some of these people, like continued conversations with some of these white nationals, they've told me, they've been like, look, man, like, I'm sorry for the way I talked to you when I first met you, you know, like seeing the way that you covered it, like you could have covered it in a way where, because of course, fake news, fake media, like every, during the course of this, Trump presidency, you know, we were considered Lugenpresse, right? Like lying press, fake news, it's the same thing. The same same idea and concept of mistrust in journalism and journalists in general. So there's always a high level of skepticism when I approach people, but when I treat them as human beings and I and I allow them to tell their story, it it helps them see themselves too. It's almost like an act of therapy for them. So I do think that we do have this idea that, that there could be more people following suit like Ken Parker did, um, but I don't really know. And I just hope that the work continues to inspire people to be them best, their best selves, so. That's great, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from people? I don't see anything in the chat, but Amanda? Well, I was just, this isn't as important as my other question, but I was just curious. Um, I kind of, yeah, I wish I, I had like a picture of you working, you know? So when mm -hmm. you're like in Charlottesville, when you're like filming kind of what's happening, is that kind of your, pri that's not really your primary medium, right? Like you're also using a, a still camera. Right. Is, is, is your thought like, I'm gonna publish this video or is the thought like, I just want to have this video in case something bad happens, then, you know, it can, this can be proof of whatever. Sure. So the video from Charlottesville in particular, the other videos of me where it's like, I'm off, I'm on camera. Those are all things that people have sent me over the course of the, over the course of years where they've seen me and they're like, look at you, you're crazy. Right. And so like that for me is like, I always did step back and it terrifies me because I'm like, I'm crazy. Like, what the fuck am I doing? This is absolutely insane. But um, in particular, the video for Charlottesville, uh, that was a live Facebook video. I went live because I walked, so as we were approaching, I went with a group of journalists, other journalists that I met up with, um, Sam Corum, uh, who's a celebrated uh, White House correspondent out of DC, who I just adore, one of my, favorite, my best friends. Um, uh, there was a guy in the video, CJ, uh, who is, works for The Daily Show and is producing this documentary called Neutral Ground. So I had a core group of people with me, but as I approached this uh, group of white supremacists who were lighting their torches that night, nobody wanted to go down to them and talk to them, right? Like nobody wanted to get in the mix. So I said, I'm crazy. 
I'm just going to jump in here, but I'm also going to turn this Facebook live video on just in case anything happens. Right. So for me, that was more of a record of like, okay, it looks like things might be getting crazy. I don't know why these like Nazis are walking around with tor tiki torches, but this is interesting and I'm going to get in the middle of it. And I want you to understand what is happening right now. Like most importantly, on alert community, there are not hundreds of Nazis with torches marching through an American city. Like it's 1939, like what the fuck is going on? So like, for me, I put that, like I put that, I turned on my Facebook live. I decided to walk through that crowd and as a, as a sense of protection for me in that moment, it was more important for me to tell that story and let people hear and see and visualize what was happening in real time than it was for me to get a Pulitzer Prize winning image of the moment, right? Like, so again, my activism took over in my mind as opposed to it being, this is something that I can come up on in my career. You know what I mean? So that is really the purpose behind that video. Guys, look at these crazy Nazis, like, what the fuck is going on so um i really hope that that continues to be and i, I think that you know it varies if i feel like oftentimes if you see me going live on any of my like social media platforms it means that i think things are really bad like <laughs> you should pay attention to it in this moment right here right now because it might be my last moment also so um that was the purpose behind that and it's so interesting because it's it, it's it's confusing you know like that video it's like who who is everybody like who's that is that you know bad guy good guy you know like what are they chanting what it's just chaos you know so it's like it's not this typical photojournalistic story or image where it's kind of distilled for us and we kind of like you know if we pay attention and we read or whatever or really look at the image we can kind of sort of figure it out but something like that it's like it's just chaos and sometimes I think that's important too to see that it's like it's not so cut and dried and and maybe right. that helps us to not polarize not that that video is going to make me sympathize with the other side or whatever but I, I'm just saying like yeah I don't know yeah, no, I think that you're right. Like it's it's important to understand the chaos, right? Like, and it's also from a process point, I think it's really, it was a great opportunity, right? Like for me to have that archival footage to understand what it is that we are doing as, as journalists who choose to walk into, into chaos, right? To tell stories and to tell the truth from a non from a, from an objective standpoint, you know? Um, I, it, it, it's a tool that I, I'm always grateful for that I, that is still in my, my pocket that I want to continue to show because that's what it is. That's what it is. That moment in time, whether I was taking photographs or not, like it is chaos. You don't know what, it, what is going on. You don't know who's going to try to kill you. You don't know if somebody's going to hit you with a tiki torch and set you on fire. Like these are all the things that like are constantly going through your mind as a journalist who's engaged in these moments while you're one, trying to tell the story, two, trying to kept the, capture the image that's going to be most compelling so that people want to hear the story. And three, overall, just trying to protect your ass while you're out here in the field. So I really, I love showing that video because it's, to me, one of the most honest moments of what it feels like to be in the midst of chaos um, and still keep your composure, still focus on the end goal, and ultimately still choose to show people in the way that they authentically choose to present themselves. Well, thank you um, again for your authentic presentation of yourself. I'm paraphrasing <laughs> carefully. Uh, <laughs> comment in the chat and um thank you yeah if there are no other questions it's probably a good mm -hmm. point to end on uh yeah. but <laughs> not without offering just sincere and profound thanks um not only for your time for the last hour and change um but for the last 12 or 13 years that you've been doing this and for the future uh, that you continue to we thank need so people much. like you and i'm i'm grateful to to have you as part of Medium um, and just grateful to even know you. Thank you guys so much. I'm just a regular dude like that has the camera that likes telling stories. So that's all there is to it. And I'm grateful to you guys for having me. This has been just like 
amazing and cathartic and, and therapy session in, in itself, right? Just talking about the work. So thank you guys so much. I love you all. Do the best work that you can with your camera, no matter what type of photographer you are. Always think about your purpose and intention. So thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Great day, everybody. Thank you.